Hey, I'm at. Hey there, how you doing? I'm. You're ready to to rock and roll, eh? Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, it looks like we've got eight people so far logged in. I'm sure there's a couple of tyklings. I see Josh has already left a message in there. So as Josh said, you know, tell us where you're calling in from and, and what interests you about GraphQL. We've got a lot of really neat stuff to show you that we've recently introduced into our Tyke platform. So Ahmed's going to be going over that. What... Uh, what time did you want to start at, Amit? We'll start around uh, maybe maybe give two more minutes for people to to putter in. Yeah, I think if we leave it till about, um, I think officially we start in about a minute or so, so we can leave it to just in case anyone's running a bit. Awesome, awesome. I will come back onto camera then. All right, we'll leave it for another 30 seconds or so here. And then Ahmet and I will, well, Ahmet mostly is going to give a very quick overview of all the great stuff that we've added in Tyke in regards to GraphQL. And he's been really excited about this all week. He's been working hard at it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like I like how you've got like uh, well I guess I'm the same way we've got two different shades of wall in the background to give us a bit of contrast so awesome uh, well whenever you're ready to go Amit I will uh, I will stay in the wings and pop in uh, if there is some questions coming up that you and I can answer Jens is on here too fantastic so if we need to pull him into the conversation we can do that too. Yeah. Right. Hello, everybody. Um, bear with me. I'm just pulling up my keynote and sharing my screen. Can you see? No, you can't see my screen yet, can you? Select Windows, entire screen. Yeah, and just for those that are using this, um, uh, I mean, Ahmet obviously takes good care of himself. He looks really nice. But if you want to see his presentation a little better, if you double click, on the window, it'll actually blow it up full screen for you. So, and I will, I will drop off my screen. Awesome. Right, I've Good got a problem. Comment. I can't share my screen until I quit Firefox and reopen it. Okay, <laughs> there we go. So I'm going to have That's to come out and come Firefox. back. In. <laughs> right. Okay, you're going to sure. practice. I can hold down the fort for a few minutes. Perfect. Thanks. Awesome. We'll see you shortly. All right, so we'll, it's not a good presentation without some technical glitches. So Ahmet is going to be back shortly, and then we will get rolling. Um, so basically, yeah, we've, we've introduced a lot of really, really cool things in our 3.0 Tyke release. And Ahmet, who will be joining us again shortly, is he's put together a deck and a quick little workshop here to show you how each of those components work. And we also have our resident expert, Jens, in the chat as well, ready to go if there are any specific questions in terms of GraphQL. Yeah, so we've got 15 people now. Awesome. Awesome. I think you're going to be really excited when you see some of these features that we've added in the last little while. I'm working very out. All right. And try it again. Is all right, let's try it out.
and oh, I can now share the entire screen. Allow. All right, there you should be able go. to see literally everything. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Perfect. And again, if if you're just joining right now and you want to see it a little bigger, if you go over top of that, if you double click it, you can maximize the video. So I will drop off the screen now, Ahmed, and uh, away you go, man. Okay. Um, well, hello, API days. Um, my name is Art Um I've spent several years helping people like yourselves getting up to speed with um, modern API management best practices. More recently, um, I look after technical research and development with Tight's product leadership team. So I'm expecting that the majority of you in this room are not developers um, or working with GraphQL on a daily basis. You're likely a technology evaluator or a member of the security team, an API product manager or responsible for the um, API platform within your organization. Um, many developers and teams um, are possibly looking to adopt GraphQL um, and expose their GraphQL services um, for other teams um, to consume. So maybe you're looking to publish your um, GraphQL API externally. We at Tyke have been th thinking about GraphQL also, and um, we've conducted quite a bit of research in the space. And in this workshop session, we'll be going over some of our learnings, covering some topics in relation to GraphQL security and governance, and then how you would go about um, managing your GraphQL API, and also how to compose your GraphQL API from services which you, know, you might already have. So this should be a, um, you should be able to follow along and hopefully we can make this workshop as interactive as possible. So whilst I go um, through the intro, please feel free to head over to tyke.io and sign up. Um, yeah, sign up with a free Tyke Cloud account. Um, and feel free to ask questions in the chat as we go along. Um, because I'm full screened at the moment, um, I might not see all of your questions straight away so if Matt can just shout out if anything comes in um, yeah I'll keep an eye out. we've been launching our initial uh, release of our graphical engine and any feedback that you might have would be much appreciated also so um, before we get started um, <clears throat> just a quick um, little tidbit about Tyke um, Tyke is an open source API gateway and management platform um, it features an API gateway Sorry, it's automatically changing slide for me. Um, it features an API gateway, API management dashboard, a developer portal, and um, it's available self-hosted um, wherever you want, completely cloud native um, via SaaS. So we offer a cloud solution and also a hybrid model where um, Tyke hosts the control plane and then you manage the data planes. It's been design, uh, designed from the ground up in Go um, to be flexible, highly performant, and work with your existing and future workflows. Um, we use a, you know, it offers a modern multi-cloud native um, architecture and microservice patterns and any more buzzwords that you might want to um, add there are fully supported. And it's not changing slide again. Can you hear me still? Yeah, yeah, can hear you still. Um, yeah, I mean, this is what happens, right? We get- No, nope, it's gone <laughs> so <forward> technical. <laughs> There we go. Right, okay. So, <clears throat> Just a little bit about um, what uh, GraphQL is. It's basically um, uh, basically RPC offering an API query language, a bit like SQL, but for APIs. Um, you have a single point of entry for querying and mutating your data. Um, you can query exactly what you want, and um, you're able to retrieve multiple resources um, with a single request. You also get PubSub functionality um, um, known as subscriptions for real-time data. So, um, just uh, just a quick diagram. It will show you. We've, you know, you declare your types and it, um, expose queries, mutations, and subscriptions. Um, yeah, queries, mutations, and subscriptions, and then you have resolvers, and these resolvers will decide how to go about grabbing the data. For example, from the database, like a function, and filling out the fields um, for you. So um, just a quick overview of some, type, um, some GraphQL terminology. You have the concept of schema, uh, schemas and types, which define the shape of your graph. Um, we have queries. They're um, akin to select statements, if you're familiar with SQL. You have mutations, which are like um, allow you to um, 
create or insert, update or delete operations. You have the concept of scalars, which are um, almost like basic or built-in types, such as int integers, floats, and booleans. And then, oh, just spelt built-in wrong. Um, and then you have resolvers, which are like query handlers. So they um, generate the responses for a particular field within the query. So it's like we're, um, it's like your business logic. So um, this Star Wars API, um, which I've converted into a graph, GraphQL API, you'll see that we have automatic documentation. I've been able to describe the person type alongside each of the fields. Um, it's much nicer, um, as you can see, and much cleaner to work with than, say, Swagger, for example. Um, and I can even mark fields as deprecated and explain why. So um, just going over a few um, success, success stories. In 2019, Airbnb software engineer, Bree Bunch, um, she said that about 5.8% of all Airbnb traffic involves GraphQL. And she expected that number to reach 10% by the end of last year. Before GraphQL, only 10 to 15% of their front-end code actually contained any business logic. The, the rest was data handling and boilerplate. GraphQL helped them to regain their productivity um, by reducing non-business related code. Um, GraphQL has become Shopify's technology of choice for building APIs. I'm not going to be reading the entire quote, you can do that for yourselves, but some key takeaways are reducing the number of round trips to the server, uh, strongly typed schema, helping to find and fix bugs um, before it affects Shopify's merchants. And we all know and love GitHub. It probably offers the world's second best known GraphQL API after Facebook. GraphQL has enabled integrators to gain access to exactly the data that they need, and GitHub still offer a REST API um, alongside their GraphQL API. I want some of that too, I hear you say. Um, you're sold on GraphQL. How might you go, up, um, go about hooking up your REST API, for example? Um, you might design and implement your GraphQL schema, connect your data source, um, write your query mutation resolvers, then ship to production. Easy, right? I'm pretty sure we're missing something here. So I could have spent the entire talk and more painting a picture through rose-tinted glasses about GraphQL, but that's not what I'm here for today. Um, Google, according to Google Trends, we can see that interest is steadily increasing with a bit of a COVID-19 blip. Now, given the apparent silver bullet, just why isn't it exploding? All the success stories you hear out there, why is interest in the technology not more exponential? Adopting GraphQL, it appears, isn't without its pitfalls. There are considerations for security, performance, separation of concerns. Um, who's responsible for what? Many of the problems which have been long solved with REST are still in their infancy with GraphQL. The key takeaway for me is that each organization that I mentioned before, they accomplished what they did in, on their own, in their own way, using experts and at a real terrific cost. There's too, there's too much to think about um, and address before you go and dive in and publish your GraphQL API. So Tyke's initial goals were to understand where API management fits with GraphQL, how we can go about helping our customers to ensure that they can safely and quickly ship their GraphQL APIs using tried and tested API management best practices, which they know already. So let's take a look at some of the challenges that we aim to address and, and alongside why they might be particularly difficult for, um, for GraphQL API specifically. We've been talking to um, a lot of our customers, including retail, finance, government from across the globe, both seasoned GraphQL early adopters and those who plan to start using the technology very soon. I'm sure most of you here today are in one of these camps. And this is far from a complete list, but we've got six items here, um, which, I, which I think is actually throttling the mass adoption of GraphQL. Who owns the graph? front-end developers, back-end developers, or the API product manager? How do I ensure governance for the GraphQL API without sacrificing agility? Do I need experts to manage the graph? In terms of authentication, where does this occur? An authorization, should I implement authorization centrally or within my services or both? Um, protected introspection, um, it's desirable, uh, or is it desirable to publish my documentation to the outside world? 
denial of service protection, how, how I protect my server from becoming overloaded due to, say, complex queries or bad actors, and how do I ensure that quality of service for the consumers of my graph? And then schema traversal attacks. Is it possible for an attacker to obtain information that they're not supposed to um, in some other way? And I'll go into a little bit, we can go into a little bit of detail about that a little bit later. Um, so your front-end team um, want to consume a GraphQL API. Front-end teams or full-stack developers, they often own the GraphQL endpoint for their applications. And the GraphQL server is typically a facade to the underlying backend services. So um, a kind of niche backend for front-end. Where front-end developers are responsible for the graph, they then become responsible for the security and the management of it. So if you think about the mantra, you built it, you own it, um, this might be frame, uh, absolutely fine for, say, frameworks or indie developers and startups, but what about the context of teams and enterprise use cases and platforms and ecosystems? Given, um, yeah, so given, given this, the success and possible wider value of our shiny new GraphQL API, imagine the business wants to publish a subset of it to a partner for external consumption. Should my front-end developers be responsible for securing the graph and nurturing it and publishing it to the third parties? Um, we've seen several cases where organizations who want to publish a subset of their graph have had to build a new niche GraphQL API specifically for that use case. Now, if you handle that, uh, hand that responsibility to the um, backend teams, then you have consideration uh, for, you know, having to get your backend teams to start potentially switch languages. Um, you introduce tighter coupling and deep coordination between the front end, the back end, and also the external consumers. Um, we also have many new roles which have been created of recent years, such as like the API product manager or a DevOps. What about API governance? Uh, where do they all fit in um, to the GraphQL picture? How can the API platform team get involved um, in order to create some wider value for the business? Um, I was going to sort of interleave this presentation with kind of demos, but what I might do is kind of go through a demo and talk about, I'm not sure which is the best way to go around. Um, what do you think? Maybe we could we could we could head into a demo. I think I think that'd be great, and then we can come back to this. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think that's great. I know that I know that you're super super comfortable with doing the demo stuff, and yeah, I think that's a great part uh, part to start at. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So I'm just going to do a couple more slides, and then um, yeah, makes sense. Sure. So just to give you a quick refresher um, on authentication and authorization and the difference between them. So authentication is about um, verifying who you are and authorization is about establishing what you can do. Now, this slide isn't really, uh, well, the image is specific to, um, to, uh, to GraphQL, but the authentication is not specific to GraphQL. At Tyke, um, where um, API gateways and API management is our business, I'm sure you can imagine that we're quite in, opinionated in terms of where we think authentication belongs. Um, this diagram, which has been borrowed from a, a Medium article by the Guild, um, we have this HTTP server that receives the requests and then sends the requests on to the GraphQL server and then onto our business logic via the resolver. So if we can take a moment to think about where authentication belongs in this request flow, um, if you think about where you put authentication and how that would impact the behavior and the flexibility of your system. Um, if anybody in the room has some thoughts about that at all, and bear in mind that I can't read, so because I haven't got any screen to read from, so you'd have to read them out if anybody has any suggestions. Has any suggestions. Yeah, sure. Is, is there anyone that is currently has currently implemented a GraphQL service of some type and have any opinions on where they would put the authentication? Is that what you're looking for, Ahmet? Yeah, looking to get some please. opinions. Okay, let's see. Let's see if anyone has any. Or you can even join us live if you'd like. We'll give uh, 30 seconds for anybody to chime in or a little less. And if not, we'll move on and, and then we can go over where 
Tyke would put this type of stuff. Cool, we can keep on going on, and then what we'll do is we'll show how Tyke handles it, and then we can flip back around if we might have some opinions. Yeah, sure. And, uh, yeah, we can, go over, we can go over why we decided that that was the best spot to put it. Okay, perfect. So um, if you have a um, monolith in the back end, it might be absolutely fine to place your authentication within your resolvers or your business logic because you've only got one place within your monolith to, to deal with it. But consider the complexity that we introduce, um, uh, that is introduced when you uh, bring microservices into the equation, where you have multiple teams who publish their APIs um, with different languages, protocols, and tooling. Some might be using PHP, others Node, others Python, C Sharp. Um, you now need to implement and maintain authentication across the entire stack. Um, you'll likely be maintaining your existing REST APIs for a while, whilst your consumers will um, you know, update to the new GraphQL API. So um, in this regard, I mean, from Tyke's perspective, it makes most sense to put that authentication between the, uh, I suppose, HTTP server and the GraphQL server. Um, in terms of authorization, um, we have, uh, just to describe what's happening in this animation here, a, a librarian should be, uh, well, we have a library with books. A librarian should be able to add new books to the library. And the librarian will have their own web application to perform full CRUD operations on the books in the library. So whilst a student should be permitted to browse and search and reserve books from the catalog, they certainly shouldn't be able to create, update, or delete any of the books. Um, the student probably should only get read access to a subset of the fields and the library that the librarian would have access to. So with REST, you've got methods and paths which you can protect with different permissions quite easily. But with GraphQL, because the query is in the body of the request, how would you go about protecting the library from the general public from being able to change um, or modify these books? So does this logic belong in the data source? should each microservice need to apply its own authorization logic? And as your graph grows, how do you maintain visibility? Do you need a separate policy server? And if your GraphQL server of choice happens to support authorization, what specific features of it should you be using? Um, we think that a GraphQL API gateway is ideally positioned to handle both authentication and at least be the policy enforcement point for authorization. Um, it can be done in almost the same way as a typical REST API call, which you're all familiar with. Um, it would allow us to have a centralized identity and access management solution, meaning that we can validate the token and check user groups, attributes, scope, validate it with a centralized policy server, and all being well, pass the relevant user information onto the GraphQL server so that it can make various decisions. So schema traversal attacks. Um, actually, before we go on to that, should I just jump into the demo set to make it a bit more interesting? Yeah, let's do that. Let's jump into the demo. And uh, from there, what we can do is everything that you've come across so far, we can we can go over each of those points. So if, uh, going over authentication, authorization, and then we can end off at this schema traversal stuff if you'd like. Okay, perfect. So <clears throat> what we've got here um, is a, you can see my uh, des dash desktop, yeah? Yep, yep we're able to, yeah. Perfect. So here we've got a, um, a, rest, uh, a, a GraphQL API called Trevor Blades. And it allows me, if we have a look at the schema, we can see that it's, um, we, we can query countries, we can query um, a, a single country or multiple countries. Um, we can get languages and all kinds of information. These are the queries that are available. And I don't know if I can make this bigger. So um, here we have arguments. So continent takes the argument um, and we can get the pass in as an argument, the code, and this will return a single continent, the same for country. So in this example, we have, um, we're querying, we're asking for a country and we're passing in DE. And then when we send the request, we get back exactly the information that we want from this API. And what we can also do 
is um, we can find out what continent the country is in. So what continent Germany is in. So we can see that it's in Europe and we can also find out which countries are in that continent. I can't shrink my, doesn't matter. So um, let's configure type to proxy to this um, GraphQL API. So we can head over to APIs Add new API, and I'm going to call it Trevor Blades. So Ahmed, I think it's good to mention that. So what we're really trying to do here is show you that if you have an existing GraphQL service or endpoint, and you want to plug it in with Tyke, that's exactly what we're doing here with this Trevor Blades service, right? It's already mm -hmm. existing, and we're just going to add Tyke on top of it. Perfect. Thanks very much, Matt. And um, using this new feature um, uh, that, we, we're, that we're introducing, um, we're going to enable um, GraphQL proxy, and we're proxying to an existing GraphQL service with the target URL countries.trevorblades.com. So um, I, if anybody wants to follow along, feel free to do so. Um, hopefully, you've all set up your account, and you should be able to do this through the tight cloud. I'm also going to make this a little bit smaller. And then, I believe that it will also be recorded. So if you wanted to follow along with it later, uh, you can do that as well. We can hit um, configure API. And for simplicity, what we'll do initially is we'll disable authentication. So we're going to change this to be a keyless API. And then hit the save button. And we can go back into there and scroll down. Oh, actually, we don't have to scroll down. We can go and click on the schema button, and you'll see what um, what Tyke has uh, what Tyke has done is sent a request to the Trevor Blades API, um, an introspection query to the uh, Trevor Blades API, and being able to pull the schema, the shape of the graph, in so that we can know um, what we're able to uh, query or proxy to. And then we also have access to the playground and the graphic your playground. So we can send a query. We can send exactly the same query via graphic up. And you can see that Tyke is receiving the request and um, has um, yeah, receive, re receiving the request and is passing that on to the uh, to the Trevor Blades API. Now, we were talking about authentication and authorization. So if we head over to core settings, and I'm just going to enable this, um, enable something from the uh, front end. If we go over to enable API playground and turn that on, and we can specify a path that it will listen on, and we can save the API. And then what we can do is we can copy the URL here and open it up in a new tab. What's going on here? Ah, I'm, I'm querying the GitHub API. I don't know why it's done that, but let's change this. If I copy that, paste that there. And then you can see it should have pulled, it's pulled in the schema. So I can send that same query again, or any query, and get the name in exactly the same way. Now, if we want to enable auth authentication to protect this GraphQL API, we can head over to Type Dashboard and we can enable authentication. simply by enabling auth token for simplicity, updating the API, and we can head back here, and we're trying to send the request. We'll see that access has been disallowed.
in order to grant access to this API again, I need to create an API key which grants access to this Trevor Blades API. I can do this simply using an API key. Press Add Key, and I can choose the API, Trevor Blades, and I can create that key. So just say do not expire key and create the key. Copy the key, head back to the playground, and I can set a HTTP header. and paste the API key there, and it should allow me to go through again. Notice it says server cannot be reached here, um, so we're not able to query the schema for this API anymore. If I refresh the page, or maybe it's cached it or something like that. So have we got any questions at all? Have we got any questions at all? No questions yet. No questions yet. Does anybody uh, does anybody have any questions at this point that they haven't posted in the chat? I'll I'll keep an eye on it, Amit, and I will let you know. Okay. So the problem. Oh, what, one sec. Yeah. Nancy said something. That if you put the token in the headers field, it is used for introspection. If you put the token in the headers field, it is used for the introspection. Ah, oh, right. Okay. So ah, oh, okay. Thanks very much, Jens. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if I head back to the dashboard now, and that, oh, actually, let's go back. Let's come back here. So the problem is that we've got the full schema here. We can, we can query the full graph. And this is now publicly available for anybody to consume. So what we can do is we can create a security policy if I create this security policy, which grants access to this Trevor Blades API. And let's give it a name. I'll call it the internal Trevor Blades. Well, I'll call it public Trevor Blades. Okay. And we head over to access rights. And what we can do is enable um, field-based permissions for this Trevor Blades API. And by enabling these field-based permissions, we can restrict access to certain queries or certain fields. So if I don't want the general public to be able to access the uh, continents query, I can turn that off. If I don't want the public to be able to query the, um, to be able to access the phone field of the country, I can turn that off. So I can then create this security policy. And at the moment, this key has access to everything. So countries, phone. See, we can get the phone now. And then if I head over to the keys and I create an API key, which grants access, um, which it's an API key, which grants access to the security policy. I create that key now. And I send that request with the new bearer token. And we can see that the field phone is restricted on type country. And if I remove the phone field, I'm able to send that request again. Does anybody have any questions so far? Yes, there is one here from Rakesh. And he says, um, I think we're going to cover it after, but I'll mention it right now. So what are a few effective ways to integrate the uh, integrate RESTful services to GraphQL to leverage the power of, Graph, of a GraphQL server? Right, OK. Um, yeah, we'll definitely get to that um, in a few slides. So. Um, no problem at all. So hold on tight. <laughs> hold on tight. Um, how long have I got okay. left, by the way? You currently have about, uh, I think, 17 minutes left. All right. I will speed up a little bit. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So I'm going to head back into Keynote and continue playing that. So 
so schema schema traversal attacks if you can take a look at my fictitious and very naive schema and query above um i should um in this particular example i should only be able to view my own bank balance yet my query shows two ways in which i can access the bank balance field of my friends so assuming that i can protect the bank balance field how do i ensure that as my graph evolves and grows i will not accidentally be able to open up a new entry point to that bank balance field or any other restricted field for that matter it's something to, something to think about because there there are probably a few ways of solving it um and it's definitely something to think about before you go ahead and put your graphql api into production um and unfortunately as can be seen from the above screen recording Causing havoc on a GraphQL API, uh, um, GraphQL server, it isn't too difficult without proper means of rate limiting or limiting the complexity of the query. There are several strategies to address this and a handful of examples might include evaluating the complexity of a query by the number of raw bytes in the request, um, quotas based on the um, a query complexity. So maybe you can send a thousand points worth of requests per hour, for example. A third way, and the way that Tyke has introduced for our initial release, is the ability to limit based on the query depth. Um, an internal user might be able to send more complex queries than a third party partner or a public developer who's consuming the graph. And third party developers on a pro or paid subscription, they might be allowed to send more complex queries than a free or trial account. So I just wanted to show you this quickly. If I could exit out of that, head back into here. So in this example, I can query um, continents or contin, if I can spell, get the name, get the countries, get the name, and I can send this request and you can see it's taking quite some time. But what I can do here, let's go for continent again name a little bit make it a bit more complex countries name. yeah refresh the page i think i've broken trevor blades and a way that we can protect to get against this quite easily um when we have a look at the security policy we can open here um the security policy we apply global limits and quota. We can scroll down and we can limit the query depth to say three and update that security policy. So now when we go back in here and we send the request, it looks like it's killed my browser as well. And then we can narrow back saying depth limit exceeded. Let's head him back over to Keynote and then play the slideshow. You've seen the protected um, introspection documentation. So if you're monetizing access to your services or your APIs are being designed for public consumption, for this, you might need a public facing developer portal. Now, normally in REST based services, you'd be publishing swagger documentation for the developers to browse, discover the capabilities of the API. And um, with GraphQL, you get this documentation for free. But with a protected API, um, with granular permissions, I think it's not playing. With a protected API, with granular permissions, why not present only the documentation that the access token is permitted to access? Um, that's security, though. In the majority of use cases, you might just be looking to um, for your front-end developers to be able to um, consume their own service. Maybe it's not designed to be shared. And in this in, in this scenario, maybe you don't want the um, outside world to be able to query the schema for your graph from both a security perspective and also to help protect your IP. So I hope that I've given you lots to think about. Um, going back over the list above, how many of these have anything to do with your business? How many of them have anything to do with solving business problems? And how many of these problems might be better abstracted away 
and centrally managed by a GraphQL aware API manager. As we continued engaging um, with the community, clients and prospects, Please, clients and prospects, we realized quite quickly that in addition to the ability to secure a GraphQL API, um, our customers wanted something more. The reality is that probably 99% of the APIs we consume are brownfield services. Um, this is, I guess this is the bit that you're waiting for. Building an ecosystem with integrated components, their fundamental requirements in the digital transformation of enterprises. Probably 15 to 20% of your web services still use SOAP today, and not everything is legacy either. REST is still king, microservices um, still, uh, or increasingly communicate over gRPC. What about Kafka topics and Rabbit exchanges? So whilst Gra GraphQL, they might provide the customer with a blissful utopia, next level experience, I don't believe there is a currently truly scalable solution to the integration problem. Unless I'm happy with that niche front end, uh, back end for front end, and I'm happy to rewrite my services or build facades and possibly be forced to introduce Node.js to my stack. I don't think it's practical. I think it's expensive to replace all of your existing systems by building them from scratch solely for the purpose of coding um, middleware layers to be able to create that back end for front end. We do see a lot um, of guidance on the web about how to rewrite um, your services to GraphQL, but not much in the way about how to go about composing your own GraphQL API from what you already have. So, so, so one yeah. thing to mention quickly. So, oh, I think Jens, Jens is actually elaborating on it right now. So continue. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. So after all, connecting your data to your users is what this is all about. The concept of the universal data graph was born at Tyke. Why can't we make it easy for our customers to have their own GraphQL API, be able to use it internally, publish for others to consume, and be able to publish their entire estate, whether that be REST, SOAP, gRPC, Kafka, or a serverless function, without any of the pain or necessity to have experts managing and maintaining the graph and at a fraction of the cost. So with that in mind, I'd just like to take you through um, the final moments of this, um, of this uh, workshop with a quick snapshot of Tyke's new GraphQL engine. Um, just imagine to yourselves what an API manager, API product manager, a platform team, or a developer getting started with GraphQL can achieve in just a few minutes with zero code. So, are you going to use the Star Wars? Are you going to use the Star Wars one? Um, I'll use. Uh, I I could use the Star Wars one. I could, I guess. Whatever one you're going to use, I was just wondering because I've seen you do it multiple times with the Star Wars. <laughs> you want the Star Wars one, <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. That in the last couple I, I don't know the URL of the Star Wars API anymore. Um, do you know? Is it Swappy Dev? I can't remember. I think it might be. Okay, so this yeah, Star Wars is. API, is. Um, we have um, swappy.dev slash API slash, right, okay, makes sense. So let's head over here and head into APIs and add a new API and I'll call it swappy. And this is a GraphQL API. And I'm gonna be composing a new GraphQL service. And I'm gonna configure that API. And for simplicity, I'm gonna turn off authentication because I don't want to protect it for this demo. So in my Swappy API, I can head into the schema. I'm going to delete these fields. And I'm going to design this API. So let me just copy a few of these fields now. So we have type, person, and name is a string. We have height, a string. We have mass, which is a string. I think they're all strings, aren't they? Yeah. Let's just take these three for the time being because I can't be bothered. Yeah, and we've got about six minutes left cool. right now, which is more than enough time. So we want to now create a query. And um, for this query, when we query a person, we want to return, um, and we need a um, we need a person ID, I believe, or some of some kind. 
person, yeah, we need an ID. The person needs an ID. ID, ID, and this should return a person. I think this is this query. And then we head over to data sources, and you can see that using, um, you can see that we've got a nice visual designer so that you can do this with a point and click as well. And you'll see that we have a query with an exclamation mark next to it. So here we have a data source, but the, uh, it's saying that we need a data source. So instead of coding resolvers, um, we have this concept called data sources, and we automatically generate your resolvers for you. So you can click on this um, pencil icon here, and we're going to attach a data source to this person query. And we can define a data source, and the data source type is REST. So we want to send a REST request for this particular fit, for this particular field. And in here, let's have a look at the URL. I'm gonna copy that and head back here. The URL is this API slash people slash, and then using the Go text template language, we want dot, and Jens might have to correct me here. I think it's arguments dot ID. And what this will do is use the query arguments to be able to inject that into the URL. And we want to send a get request and update that field. And then we can now update this API. And when we head over to the playground now and write a query, we can look for a person where their ID is one, and we can ask for their name, their height, and their mass, and send that request. And hey, we've got um, Luke Skywalker's details. And then I think number two might be C3PO. So what you've done here is just to recap. So what you've done here is you've taken an existing RESTful API and basically built a GraphQL API on top of it is what you've done. Yeah, exactly. Is that is that a good? Yes, idea? exactly. Okay, and I've done perfect. all of this with zero code. So the idea is this will, you know, you can export this, you can, we have lots of tooling around this to be able to extract the API definitions. We can export them or plug that into your CI CD pipelines and then migrate this from my dev environment through to staging, QA, production, all with no code. And and I guess the nice part about this is because it's built on top of Tyke, you get all of those those great Tyke features, but now you can start applying those to your GraphQL APIs, as well as taking your existing RESTful APIs, whether you have them in Tyke or whether you have some something else, uh, you can take those interfaces. Exactly, so, you know, where where I designed where I define the data sources, um, at the moment we're yep. currently supporting um, in, in the data sources we're currently supporting REST, which is a third party REST API, a third party GraphQL API, or also services which are managed by Tyke already. Um, but we will be introducing yep. more data sources further down the line, and it would be great to have some feedback from yourselves so, on um, what particular kind. Uh, you know, what data sources are particularly useful for you. Um, yeah, so I got, I got a quick question mm -hmm. for you and it's completely off the cuff. So let's see. Um, Rakesh, Rakesh says that you did show what he was looking for. Awesome. Uh, Rakesh, if, if you do have more questions, you can drop by our, our expo booth and we'd be really happy to, to answer more for you. Or we can ask Ahmed to show up and, and uh, he can show you a little more in-depth stuff as well. But one question I had for you, Ahmed, just before we link, uh, before we take off, is let's say I have a SOAP service and I interface that with Tyke as a Tyke REST service. And you know what I'm getting at here. <laughs> is there any way for me at this point to take that Tyke REST SOAP service and then expose it through that graph API? Yeah, absolutely. So what you can do, um, I'm not gonna save this, but if you click on import API and we can import a WSDL. And when you import a, new, a WSDL, and I don't actually know a public WSDL, um, but what it would do is let's find any, 
I'll just find this one. And what it will do is find, it will map um, endpoints to the SOAP underlying SOAP services or SOAP actions. And then what you can then do is convert those to JSON, for example, and then um, hook yep. those into the GraphQL engine. And now you're publishing um, SOAP services as GraphQL. So it's not, um, okay. it's, it's possible. Um, definitely possible. What's also very, very powerful yeah. from this, I yeah. mean, at the moment, in this particular example that I showed was, um, you know, I'm only talking to a single um, a single service that, or a single data source, but the power really comes where I'm able to create a, um, a composed service from multiple. So maybe I can join data from uh, REST services, GraphQL services, or, you know, you know multiple, you know, you, you might have multiple teams and you want to be able to publish those as a single graph and that becomes relatively trivial using um doing it in this way okay awesome well we're, we're down to our last minute so what i will mention is if if everyone enjoyed this definitely also show up for Ahmet's 25 minute uh track talk that we have going on and that is happening a little bit later today so Want to know more about it? We'll be doing a few more things there. It'll be relatively similar to what we covered here, but it might go a little more in depth and we can handle more questions then. And also, please drop by our booth. Uh, we have lots of folks on hand that are able to answer your questions and start to get a little to know a little bit more about our universal data graph that we've introduced with Tyke. Yeah, and obviously, everything I've showed you today is available for you to use for free. Um, all you need to do is sign up for the Tyke Cloud account if you haven't done so already. Um, and also UX wants to speak to you. So please drop us an email, ux at type.io, and you can help us shape, shape the future of the universal data graph. So thanks very much for um, taking the time to listen to me this morning. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ahmed. Cheers. See you later.